This video is sponsored by Supremacy 1914. Siberia is Russia's superpower. It holds 80% of its oil and 85% of its natural gas. It comprises this entire region from the Ural Mountains in the west to the Pacific Ocean in the east. In the mid-1800s, Siberia was still largely undeveloped. These enormous stretches of taiga, steppe and forests were inhabited by some indigenous tribes. Some of them still considered themselves subjects of the Chinese emperor. But Siberia was becoming increasingly relevant. In that time, the Western Pacific was turning into the world's political center of gravity. The Spanish, Portuguese and the British were firmly establishing themselves in this region and Russia needed Siberia to have access to this emerging market. The Americans had just purchased Louisiana and they were building the Transcontinental Railroad to settle the American West. The British were doing the same thing with the Canadian Pacific Railway and Russia feared that they would use this railroad to concentrate British forces on Vladivostok. Russia wasn't developing Siberia to the same extent. Their biggest cities, Vladivostok and Khabarovsk, had a combined population of just 45,000, while just across the border there were 300 million Chinese. Russia had a strategic weakness in a time where global powers were fighting over influence in the Western Pacific. Their choice was to either develop this region or to risk that another nation would do it for them. But between European Russia and their territory in the Far East laid thousands of miles of uncharted wilderness. This is how Russia conquered Siberia with a railroad. With hindsight. In the mid-1800s, Russia included Finland, parts of Poland, Eastern Europe and most of Central Asia. Further east lies the Altai region. This region in 1850 produced 95% of Russia's silver, 80% of its lead and it held large reserves of copper and gold. But by the mid-20th century, most of Siberia was still undeveloped. In the time of Catherine the Great, a highway was built from Moscow to Yekaterinburg, which was later extended to Lake Baikal and even reaching as far as China. But this road quickly fell in disrepair, as it lay far from populated areas and was therefore difficult to maintain. This led to most people choosing the alternative option, to travel by water. In the mid-1800s, in Western Siberia alone, there were somewhat 8,000 kilometers or 5,000 miles of water routes. This complex network of rivers was the best option, but it had some limitations. In the winter, the water would freeze, and during spring, the snow in the Arctic would melt and turn these rivers into raging torrents. This made water transport only possible for about four months each year. One of the reasons I love this story is because it immerses me into a time that is so different from my own. And that's why I'm proud to present Supremacy 1914, the sponsor of today's video. Supremacy 1914 is a game that lets you choose a country during World War I. As its leader, you must balance the production of materials, troops and weaponry. You can form alliances with other countries or do trade deals. You can play actual historic scenarios on historical maps with accurate units and buildings. Or you can play a completely made up scenario. It's a real time multiplayer game for browser and mobile with up to 500 real players per map. But let me warn you, this game is a challenge. You need to strategize on a geopolitical scale, which is no easy thing to do. Click the link in the description to start playing today. So Siberia, with bad roads and limited river access, was mostly inaccessible. And this held back its development. But the reality was that Russia just had different priorities. Russia was engaged in a rivalry with Great Britain over influence in Central Asia. This became known as the Great Game. European countries were industrializing and they were expanding their influence to the far corners of the world. Russia was no different. 
In the 1860s, their population was growing fast, but Russia was still mostly a rural society. In this time, Alaska was part of Russia, and they had just annexed land on the Sea of Japan, which they were turning into their regional stronghold. One concern of Russia was China. Russia's troops were stationed in Shertensk, Khabarovsk, and Vladivostok, but bad infrastructure limited their movement. The Russians have a word, Rasputista, which describes the seasons of bad roads. When the ground is falling and there's a lot of rain, the roads are in terrible condition. If the Chinese would attack in March during the Rasputista, it would take the Khabarovsk battalion one and a half to two months to arrive to the front line, while units in Sretensk would not be able to mobilize until at least May 1st. On top of that, these battalions depended on grain from Manchuria for their food supply, which China could easily have cut off. And I deliberately haven't mentioned Japan up to this point. If you know their history, you know where we're going with this. But Russia and Japan in that time had good diplomatic relations, and the Russian elite didn't perceive them as threatening. The urgency of developing Siberia and the need to develop Russia's Far East were well known in St. Petersburg. But Russia's ministers couldn't agree on how to approach this problem. Russia's Minister of Railways proposed building a railway following the Northern Route, which was rejected by Russia's Minister of Finance, who firmly believed in the construction of a Southern Route. This led to a personal feud between the ministers that stalled any progress for years. The Russian Empire was an autocracy, with the Tsar acting as the supreme authority. The ministers were fighting to influence his thinking. Local leaders lobbied for building a railroad that ran through their regions, and other ministers rejected the idea entirely. Instead, some wanted to invest in improving the waterways, and others argued the benefits of expanding the naval fleet in Vladivostok. Bureaucracy, personal feuds, and other priorities stalled any progress. But then in late 1886, there came a turning point. Two governors from the Far East sent a report to Tsar Alexander III describing a desperate situation near the Chinese border and the strategic urgency for the construction of a railroad, and these letters struck a chord. The Tsar ordered the report to be read to the ministers, along with a personal statement. It read, it must be confessed with sadness and shame that up to now, the government has done almost nothing to satisfy the needs of this rich but neglected region. And it is time, long since time. By command of the highest authority, it was spoken that the Trans-Siberian Railroad had to be built. This is where Sergei Witte enters the scene, Russia's new Minister of Finance. He formed part of a committee that was chaired by Grand Duke Nicholas Alexandrovich, who was only 23 years old and heir to the throne. Witte dreamt of the railroad becoming an alternative to the Suez Canal. In his words, Russia is poorly situated to become a naval power, but railroads would compensate for its inability to float a great navy. In 1891, construction started. The Trans-Siberian Railway was initially subdivided into four sections. The Western Siberian, Central Siberian, Transbaikal, and the Usuri Railroad, which connected Vladivostok and Khabarovsk. A part of the original line crossed through China, where Russia leased land and established Russian strongholds. The railroad was initially designed as a single track that would span thousands of kilometers, and this required a lot of iron. The intent was to rely on Siberia's iron industry. There were three iron factories in Siberia, but despite large state subsidies and large orders, none of them was capable to keep up with production. They fell back on other producers, mainly in the Urals, Poland, and Great Britain, these materials were shipped to the Kara Sea, to the mouth of the Ennesi River, where they were put on barges to sail upstream to the port of Krasnoyarsk. For the far eastern sections, steel and material was partly imported from the United States because of its relative proximity and low cost of shipping. This railroad was the greatest challenge that Russian engineers had ever faced. The terrain was varied extreme, and little was known about its geography. The project started under Tsar Alexander III, but when he unexpectedly passed away, 
Nicholas II became the new Tsar. He was only 26 years old and he was already deeply invested in this project. He was the only Tsar who had ever traveled to the Far East. This had a lasting influence on him and he made the railroad a national priority. He set the goal for the construction to be completed within 10 years. This put immense time pressure on the construction. Many tracks were laid without properly surveying the terrain and without a clear idea of the exact route. In some sections, they just started building with only a direction in mind. The Russian Technical Society concluded that more than half of the route wasn't even surveyed, but these same men also said that it would take a hundred years to build it perfectly. Under the watchful eye of the Tsar, who was guided closely by Sergei Witte, the railroad's construction was advancing rapidly. All materials and machines had to be transported from thousands of kilometers away. Tens of thousands of laborers were deployed who all needed housing, food and basic services. For the western sections, most laborers were locals, but for the sections in the Far East, they relied on prison labor. Prisoners were only paid 30% of the normal wage and they had to pay for their own transport, clothing, food and military convoy. This effectively came down to nothing. On the section from Vladivostok to Khabarovsk, about 60% of the labor force were Chinese, who only received 60% the normal wage. The committee wanted to attract workers who would eventually settle here along the line. They offered settlers free travel to their destination and each settler was eligible for a government loan. The state offered free medical assistance and education and the price of food was kept artificially low. In addition, settlers would be exempt from all taxation for the first 10 years. The central line posed many challenges. It ran through the Sayan Mountains, which had high hills with steep forested slopes. But the most formidable obstacle was Lake Baikal. It is surrounded by steep, rugged mountains and required several cuts and tunnels. The committee wasn't sure how to approach this and came up with a temporary solution. They commissioned this icebreaker, which could transport trains from the lake's western to its eastern shore. It wasn't a perfect solution, but for now, it worked. The sections through the Yablonoi Mountains were equally tough. The crew was pestered with disease, droughts, rains, and at some point a 200 mile or 320 kilometer long section of track completely washed away during a flood. Little was known about this environment, and it wasn't much better between Vladivostok and Khabarovsk. But despite these challenges, in 1900, the Western and Central Siberian lines were opened for operation. And it went terribly wrong. A locomotive was scheduled to be the first to drive from Mariinsk to Achinsk. And shortly after leaving the station, it drove off the line and fell into a river below the tracks. This would not be an isolated event. In the first year of operation, there were 924 wrecks. 500 people were injured and 93 people died. The average maximum speed for passenger trains was reduced to only 21 kilometers or 13 miles per hour. And the railroad was capable of handling only six trains per day between stations. Meanwhile, Russia was entering a domestic crisis. Harvests were failing nationwide and there was a growing discontent about the Tsar. To make matters even worse, in China there was a huge uprising of locals who protested foreign influence. This challenged Russia's control over the portion of the railway and it also posed the railroad's first real test. Russia mobilized 120,000 soldiers and transported them over rail to China. 40 locomotives and tens of cars wrecked along the way. But despite these setbacks, Russia was successful in occupying Manchuria and they secured control over the line. In 1904, Russia was connected from the east to the west by rail. A dream was accomplished within the set deadline and the first test was moderately successful. But Russia's new developments in Siberia were closely monitored by China and Japan, who were wary 
Russia's intentions in the Far East. China responded by increasing its troops in Manchuria to 85,000. But Japan had a different tactic. In February 1904, a squadron of Japanese destroyers attacked Port Arthur and positions on the Korean Peninsula. This marked the beginning of the Russo-Japanese War. The attack began Russia's and Japan's mobilization of forces. But Russia had the problem that at this time of the year, Lake Baikal was still frozen. Their ferry was stuck and they now deployed hundreds of soldiers to build a temporary railroad over the frozen lake. It took them eight months to fully mobilize and during that time their Pacific fleet was largely destroyed. The war led to Russia retreating from Manchuria and it showed a new reality about their railroad. It showed how poor the quality of the tracks really was and how it's a strategic weakness to have it run through foreign territory. This started a new phase of construction. The line was already built and now it had to be improved and forced and redirected to achieve Russia's true goal. The single track was replaced with a double track for most sections on the route. Many bridges that were built with soft pine wood that had already started to rot were replaced with sturdier constructions and the line was laid entirely for Russian territory. By 1916, it looked like this. The last piece of the puzzle was the construction of the Khabarovsk Bridge. This bridge is 64 meters high and 2.6 kilometers long, and it became known as the Amur Miracle. The Trans-Siberian Railroad is celebrated for its ingenious engineering. It was built at an average speed of 740 kilometers or 460 miles per year and has a total length of 9,300 kilometers or 5,700 miles. Some of the most striking achievements are its bridges and the sections through mountainous terrain. The visionary behind this project, at least in popular imagination, is Sergei Witte but he is also often blamed for the project's shortcomings. The project was plagued with corruption. Many officials stole building materials, either for personal use or to sell them cheaply to their friends. Such issues could have been solved quickly and efficiently through local authority, but the commission in St. Petersburg didn't delegate such power. In 1897, the population of Siberia was 4.6 million, by 1914, it was raised to 7.6 million. The railroad helped strengthen Russia's position in East Asia, and it transformed the economic, social, and intellectual life of Siberia. It opened vast territories to exploitation, settlement, and industrialization, and it has evolved into becoming an important tourist attraction. During World War II, the railroad was used to transport military supplies from the US to the army of the USSR to fight against Nazi Germany, proving its use during times of war. The railroad didn't spawn large urban centers and Siberia is still mostly empty, but it secured Russia's grip on Siberia, complete with all of its resources and thousands of miles of Arctic coastline. I want to thank Supremacy1914 again for sponsoring this video. This game puts you at the helm of your favorite nation during World War I. Click the link in the description to start playing today. This will not only get you a free game, it is also your best way to support this channel. If you don't want to stop now, consider watching one of these two videos next.